So the organizers asked me to talk about vulnerabilities in TLS. And I said, really, are you sure? I mean, uh, almost everybody who wants to hear me talk about this has already heard me talk about this. Uh, so I was very reluctant, but then they twisted my arm a little bit harder, and they promised me you know, nice food and good weather, and they lied to me. <laughs> so here I am, talking about uh, TLS again. Um, so let me f start by making some opening remarks. So the first thing I'd really encourage you to do is to interact. Um, that means me asking you questions and you answering them, right? But that also means you asking <coughs> questions and me avoiding them, okay? So we'll try. We'll try our best. No, but seriously, um, you'll get more out of this and you'll feel more involved and more awake if you ask me questions on the way through. Um, and I will try to make that happen, which means me picking individuals out from the audience and making them stand up and say things. Okay? So you're warned. Much better, <coughs> much better to volunteer than to be pressed into speaking. There is no theory. Yes. Fantastic. Um, it's really exciting that I'm at a, a summer school on attacks and I can talk about attacks without having to talk about theory. Well, there's almost no theory. And actually, it's actually a pity there's no theory because one of the really interesting things about this subject is that we have all of these attacks. We have this wonderful cryptographic theory that says there should be no attacks. So how can you reconcile these two things? Right? We're, what's sitting in the gap between the theory and the attacks? What's going on? Why is there a gap? I'm not allowed to talk about that because this is a summer school on attacks. Okay? But catch me in the break and I'll tell you what I really think. <coughs> Um, I'm going to repeat myself. So I've given lots of summer schools and winter schools and talked about TLS and other things. So I apologize in advance if you've heard this already. So hands up if you've heard me speak about TLS already. One, two, three, four. Quite a few of you, okay. But it'll be worth it. There'll be new things. There might even be new jokes, you know, so pay attention. Okay. So, but I apologize if you've heard some of this or all of this before. Um, I'm not going to be complete either, so I decided to focus a lot on the symmetric cryptography that's used in TLS and ignore all of the nice public key stuff that's used there too. Um, partly because most of my research has been in that symmetric key area and I don't know so much about the, the public key parts of TLS. Uh, it's also a question of time. Okay? There's, there's TLS is this kind of infinitely complex protocol <coughs> and you can just kind of take a slice through it and pick out a few different aspects and talk about them. I mean, if we were here all week and it was just me speaking, then maybe we could do the whole thing, but you don't want that. Okay, so that's the only remarks. Uh, so the most important thing is the interaction part, so please ask questions. And are there any questions at this stage? This is the point where I should have planted a question, right? There's none. Okay, well, we'll carry on. So uh, here's an overview of what I'm going to talk about. So most of this first lecture is just going to be introducing TLS and give you some kind of overview of the way that I think TLS works, which may not be actually the way it does work. It's a view. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the beast attack and the crime attack uh, quite briefly. Then in lecture two, we'll spend a lot of time talking about padding oracle attacks, the lucky 13 attack, and some more little twists on that that have, that have come out. Lecture three, uh, we'll talk about attacks on RC4 in TLS. Um, and then in lecture four, we'll see. Um, I haven't written lecture four yet. We might not get there, depending on how, much, uh, how, how fast we go or how slowly we go. Um, but there's a variety of different options there that we could talk about. Some of them I already have slides for, and other ones I don't. Uh, so depending on what you guys want to do, you will create a very sleepless night for me or, or not making slides. So we'll, maybe we'll do a poll at the end of lecture two or lecture three and see, see what you want to do, what you want to study. Okay, we can do any of these things. The best one, okay, the, the prettiest pictures are in this talk, and the coolest attack is in this one. Yeah. So you can think about that. The other stuff is kind of boring, and I don't have slides for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, advert, right? There is this thing called Real World Crypto. It's a workshop with lots of really, really interesting speakers from academia and industry. It's happening in London from the 7th to the 9th of January 2015. This is the third edition of Real World Crypto. Uh, please come. Uh, there is support for students. We have lots and lots of sponsors who, are, who should be on this slide, but are not. Like, it's about 10 different sponsors now, so we've got lots of funding to support students to come to the, to the workshop. And if you enjoy this talk, then you're guaranteed to enjoy Real World Crypto. And it's in London too, which I'm told is kind of a cool place. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't go there, but I'm told it's a cool place. Uh, any of you already registered for Real World Crypto? Anybody register already? Fantastic, fantastic. So we'll try and double that number this week. That's our target. So tell your friends about how great real world crypto is going to be and we'll, we'll get the numbers up, okay? Uh, in fact, we already have like 100 people registered or something and there's only 400 spaces. So don't wait too long before you register. 
okay, try and panic you into registering. Uh, okay, so I will repeat this advert at various points during the talk, <coughs> trying to kind of reinforce the message that this is the place to be uh, in January. Okay, so let's then start with the TLS overview, and this is going to last probably an hour, maybe even slightly longer. Um, and it might be a little bit dry at points, but you need to understand what TLS is and how it works in order to understand how the attacks are working. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to go through this even though it's going to be painful. So, for a quick check, have any of you ever used TLS? <laughs> Who's never used TLS? Hand up if you've never used it. <laughs> Nobody's brave enough to put their hand up. Okay, so, I mean, the fact is you're all using it all the time. How many of you are on laptops right now? Okay, first of all, that's really rude. You should close your laptop. <laughs> no, okay. You don't need to be on your laptop. But you're probably using TLS if you're on your laptop. If you're reading your email or if you're logged into Google in some way, whatever you're doing, you're probably, or if you're looking at Twitter to see my Twitter feed, Right? You're probably using TLS right now. It's de facto the secure protocol of choice that lots and lots of applications are using these days. So it started off life a long time ago in the mid-1990s at Netscape Corporation um, called SSL, Secure Sockets Layer. And uh, SSL version 1 actually never made it out of the lab. It, got, it was broken at birth. Okay? Uh, SSL v2 made it out of the lab into products. It's now deprecated, so you shouldn't really be using it anymore. But in fact, even though it's absolutely garbage in terms of security, something like 25 or 29% of servers will still speak SSL version 2 to you if you, if you ask them too nicely. Okay? Uh, SSL version 3 is still very widely supported out there in the kind of TLS world, the TLS ecosystem. Then in the, in the late 1990s, uh, the IETF got hold of, 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 uh, of SSL. They realized it was important. And they came up with their version of it, which is called TLS, Transport Layer Security. And I'll try and use TLS throughout rather than SSL, TLS, or SSL. But I'll get confused. Um, so the first version of TLS, TLS 1.0, was published in 1999 in RFC 2246. And RFCs are the IETF's version of standards. Okay? You think of this as like a, a standard or a specification for the protocol. Um, it's a very dry document. I think it's probably 60 pages long, something like that. And it's kind of hard reading, um, but it specifies everything you need if you want to implement SSL or TLS from scratch. TLS 1.0 is basically the same as SSL version 3 with a few small tweaks to the crypto. And we'll, we'll talk about exactly what those tweaks are later. And then um, TLS has kind of continued to evolve over the years, mostly in response to attacks. So 1.1 came out in 2006. Uh, it's basically 1.0 plus a few tweaks, and specifically changing the way that the initialization vectors are generated in CBC mode encryption. And we'll see why that was necessary later on, maybe tomorrow or this afternoon. TLS 1.2 then came out in 2008, and again had some tweaks on top of uh, TLS 1.1. And now TLS 1.3 is actually under development in the IETF, in the TLS working group of the IETF. And it's a complete bun fight. Uh, as an English phrase, it's um, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say it. They're kind of designing TLS on the back of an envelope um, and then hoping that it's secure. Now that's a very kind of, um, well, that's a very rude thing to say. I mean, they have a lot of very good crypto engineering experience in the TLS working group, but they don't have as much input from the cryptographic security or the cryptographic research community as they're designing this protocol. And that really scares me because they're making significant changes to TLS 1.2 to make the new version of TLS 1.3. It really should be called TLS 2.0 because the changes are really quite radical from 1.3, from 1.2 to 1.3. Anyway, um, that's going on at the moment. So the whole thing is changing all the time, actually. It's a bit of a moving target if you're thinking about getting into this area. Okay, so why is TLS important? Well, it started off life as this thing for secure e-commerce. So you could send your credit card number across the internet, right? So you could buy stuff on, online. Uh, I'm not even sure what the websites were. Did Amazon exist in 1996? Maybe just. Um, but then it started to become used more widely, and now we're using it for practically everything. Uh, all the way down to, for example, after the Snowden revelations, Google started using uh, TLS for connecting its servers to each other in the back end, the part of the system that you don't see in Google's internal networks, for example, because they were being they were going, you know, they were intercontinental networks and they were potentially being surveyed by NSA. Okay? So they switched on encryption there. Yahoo similarly did the same kind of thing in, in the light of the stone revelations. So it's used everywhere. And as I said, a 
few slides ago, it's become the kind of de facto secure protocol of choice. If you're a, an application developer and you need secure communications from your client, your app, say running on a mobile phone, back to some server, you'll reach for a TLS library and you'll use TLS and it's very easy to use uh, and that's why it gets used. Okay, so it's used literally by hundreds of millions of people every day and by hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of devices every day. So TLS is kind of important. It's not the only secure communications protocol out there. So you also have things like SSH, IPsec, WEP, WPA, WP2. Mobile phones have their own algorithms, their own crypto layer built in. So there's, there's, there's lots of crypto being used for secure communications. But this is probably the one that's most visible to most people, or almost most visible, right? You don't really know that you're using TLS. All you get is that little browser log in your, in your browser telling you the switch number. OK, so the point of this slide is to say that TLS matters. TLS is important. I want to give you now uh, a one million meter high view of how TLS works. And this is highly simplified and actually wrong, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, because I think it's helpful to begin with. So the TLS protocol is always run between a client and a server. And this reflects the kind of historical starting point of, of where TLS started life. Um, I don't know whether you can really see this very well, because the, the screen, the, the contrast is not very high. But they, they run something called the handshake protocol initially. And the purpose of the handshake protocol is to negotiate what kind of crypto they're going to use. Can you see it at all, Antoine? Yeah, nothing. No, nothing. You can see nothing. Okay. Uh, I will. Um, <laughs> I, I I will explain. I will explain. I'll try to avoid blue as well. Maybe I'll go through and change some slides. Uh, so they negotiate what kind of crypto they're going to use. Whether they're going to use CBC <laughs> mode or RC4. Whether they're going to use RSA encryption for setting up the keys, or they're going to use Diffie-Hellman key exchange, for example. They authenticate. Normally, the server is authenticated to the client using some kind of digital certificate and the ability to create a signature or something else. We'll see later on exactly how. And then they also establish some kind of session keys that they're going to use for their secure communications. So in this part here, it's about authentication and key establishment, okay? And also uh, negotiating exactly what crypto they're going to use. And then we have the record protocol, which then runs afterwards. And the record protocol Again, you can't see it, but this is about using symmetric crypto for speed to provide confidentiality and integrity or authenticity of application data. Your bank account number or your credit card number or your, your, your uh, Twitter message or whatever. Important stuff like Twitter messages. Um, and it gets its keys from the handshake protocol. Okay? So you have a kind of two-phase or actually a three-phase thing. You run the handshake protocol, you derive keys, which I haven't shown here. <laughs> and then you use those keys in the record protocol afterwards. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, this is very, very simplified. The real protocol is more complex than this, and the phases are kind of intermixed, and you can do various crazy things. Um, we'll see later. Okay, but that's the kind of thing that we're going to analyze, and we're going to mostly look in the rest of these lectures that I'm giving at the record protocol component, the, the, the bit that does symmetric crypto. Okay, this you can see, I hope. This is uh, a different way of looking at TLS. This is something called the TLS protocol architecture. So how many of you are familiar with network layering as a concept? <coughs> protocol stacks. How many of you are mathematicians? Yeah, okay, there's quite a kind of disjunction there, right? But never mind, that's okay. I was a mathematician once too. Okay, so for the mathematicians in the room, have you heard of TCP? Yes? No? Okay. So TCP stands for Transport Control Protocol. And this is a very nice uh, way of communicating between two entities on a network that gives you a good, solid, reliable communications protocol. So you send messages in at one end, and they magically appear at the other end, at the other end of the network, in, a, in, a, in, a, in such a way that the, the two endpoints uh, don't need to deal with all the messy business of handling errors and sending retransmissions if a packet is lost or something. It's a nice clean communication channel. Okay, and we can build. You can. You can. Uh, the TCP protocol is very well specified, and it itself runs on top of another protocol called IP, which I've not shown in this protocol. IP stands for Internet Protocol. Okay, and IP is where the internet packets live. These little packets that are whizzing across the internet. Okay, so to say that TCP runs over IP means that TCP makes use of IP to actually communicate. It doesn't do the communication for itself. In the same way, we have the record protocol running over TCP. So TCP is, is providing a communication <coughs> service to the record protocol. 
And the record protocol is where all of our symmetric encryption is going on. And our and decryption and all those other integrity protection and all those other good things. Okay? And then the record protocol is providing communication services to these other four protocols. In fact, there's many protocols here. But I've got four boxes. The handshake protocol, which is where the key exchange takes place and the authentication. Something called the change cipher spec protocol, which I'll talk about later. The alert protocol, which is used for, for managing TLS, for sending error messages and saying, hey, my key is about to run out of its lifetime. Let's, let's agree new keys, that kind of thing. And then we also have here uh, application layer protocols like HTTP, okay, running on top of the record protocol. That means that HTTP doesn't directly communicate for itself. It sends its messages to the record protocol and the record protocol does the communication. In fact, that's a lie. The record protocol actually sends its messages to TCP, to TCP and TCP takes care of it. Okay? So this idea of one protocol being sent by another one, by encapsulated inside another protocol. Now, you should have a question at this point. How is it possible, if, if the keys for the record protocol come from the handshake protocol, how can the handshake protocol run over the record protocol? It doesn't make any sense, right? And this is one of the wonderful things about TLS, one of the kind of amazing things, is that initially, the record protocol has no keys and really does nothing. So the first time you run the handshake protocol over the record protocol, there's no crypto provided by the record protocol. All the keys are null, there's no encryption going on. And when, when you get to the point where the handshake protocol has agreed a key, you then switch on the crypto in the record protocol layer, and that's what this change cipher spec protocol message does. It says, I'm ready to start using the crypto. Everything after this point will be encrypted. And thereafter, uh, you've got your crypto switched on in the record protocol, and the rest of the handshake protocol and all these other protocols run over this kind of encrypted uh, record protocol layer. Okay? So initially, there's no crypto. The handshake protocol is running over kind of like a null record protocol. Crypto gets switched on, and off we go. Everything's secure from that point on, at least in theory. Any questions about that? If you've seen protocol layering before, this should not be too mysterious, right? If you haven't, well, you're probably lost, and that's, that's tough. Okay. Okay. Uh, fine. So the next few slides, I want to talk about somehow the, the kind of complexity of the TLS landscape, what I call the TLS ecosystem, okay? Um, because TLS is everywhere, on every, pretty much every platform, from your mobile phone to you know, a high-end server, and it's being used for lots of different <coughs> purposes, it's become a very kind of rich collection of systems and services and people developing and using TLS and, and its relatives. So of course we have servers, um, which might be your web server running in your lab, but it might also be managed for you by a company like Cloudflare or Akamai, one of these big content distributors. Okay, so they, they're hosting TLS services for your customers. You've got clients of all shapes and sizes, so you, it'll be on your smartphone, probably not on your old Nokia whatever, Nokia 5000 series phone or something, uh, but everything from a smartphone all the way up will, will run TLS. There's a whole ecosystem of what I call certification service providers, these are CAs basically, who are certifying public keys. There's a very kind of rich uh, ecosystem there. There's hundreds of different CAs, uh, some of them more trustworthy than others all different shapes and sizes, offering different levels of security and different levels of service with different crypto options. There are software vendors who are supplying the software for the servers, the clients, and the CSPs. And that starts from the scale of Google all the way down to a one-man operation operating out of his garage, okay, who really doesn't understand crypto. You know, and then think about that when there's an attack against some particular configuration of TLS, this one man in his garage or his bedroom or his garden shed Okay, has to somehow fix his implementation of TLS and keep his customers happy. Well, that's going to be challenging. Um, Nadia already mentioned in her talk OpenSSL as being the probably the biggest or the most uh, widely deployed crypto library. Uh, OpenSSL is somewhere in between the scale of Google and these one-man open source operations. It's like one man and his dog, basically. Okay. That's pretty rude, actually. There's, there's, there's more than one man and his dog. There's about half a dozen core developers in Open SSL, and then lots of other people who are trying to contribute to the, to the code base. And still, it's not kind of a large scale professional organization, and it's part of the Internet's critical infrastructure, Open SSL, which is kind of scary, right? It's full of bugs, and it's maintained by three or four people you know, on a part time basis. 
There are also hardware vendors. I haven't mentioned any names here, but if you're running a very large scale TLS deployment, you know, if you've got a big website and you've got hundreds of thousands of connections hitting your website all the time, like your Facebook or something, you might want to buy some special purpose hardware that does all the crypto in TLS for you, particularly the handshake crypto, which is the public key stuff. That's become less and less important because crypto has got faster and become less of a percentage of the overall cost of running TLS. Okay? So hard, I think if you're a hardware vendor trying to sell TLS hardware, probably it's time to sell your shares and go and do something else. I don't think there's a long term there. Okay, then the, other, the next bit of complexity in TLS comes from the fact that there are all these different versions, all doing slightly different things. Um, and they're all sort of, well, they try to maintain some kind of backwards compatibility. So the first thing that a client and a server do is try to figure out which version of SSL or TLS they're going to use. Basically, the client will say, I'd like to use TLS 1.2. And the server will say, I don't know about TLS 1.2. <coughs> That's it. It's game over. Okay? The client then has to come back and say, oh, I'd like to use TLS 1.1. And the server will say, I don't know about TLS 1.1. And then, so this is called the TLS fallback problem. You end up using the lowest common version that both parties will support. But that negotiation is not secured. Okay? There's, no, there's no state between uh, the attempt to use TLS 1.2 and then the attempt to use TLS 1.1 and then the, the actual resolution to use TLS 1.0. Which means an active attacker, man in the middle, can always force you back to the lowest version. Okay? You can get forced back all the way to SSL 3.0. <coughs> This is kind of bad, but it's a feature of the protocol. And indeed, many servers will still support SSL 2.0. If you want a cool, um, almost publishable research problem to work on, here's one. Find the best attack you can, the most practical, show me the plain text kind of attack against SSL 2.0. I don't think that's really been done convincingly yet, and that's why lots of servers will still support SSL 2.0. None of the modern clients, like Chrome or uh, Mozilla, um, what, what's their browser called? Uh, Firefox, thank you. None of those things will support SSL 2.0 anymore. But there'll be old stuff out there, like Internet Explorer 5 or something, probably still running SSL 2.0. Okay? That's a guess, but probably. So there's still some value in, in killing SSL 2.0, killing it as dead as you possibly can kill it, right? Stamping it into the ground. And so that'd be a fun thing to do. Okay. So there's these, all these TLS versions. There's also a lot of diversity in the crypto that you can use. So there's a very nice list of cipher suites maintained at this website, the sprawl.org. It's a good name for the website. Um, and there's more than 200 of them. So a cipher suite tells you, gives you a complete specification of what crypto you're going to use in the subsequent uh, run of the, of the TLS protocol. So here's an example. This is a very esoteric one. It says TLS. Kerb5 means Kerberos5, so it's using Kerberos5 to do the authentication in the handshake. Kerberos is this old, uh, well, widely used protocol actually for authentication and key establishment. With triple DES in encrypt, decrypt, encrypt mode, uh, with CDC mode, and then using HMAC based on MD5 for the integrity. So this is clearly a user who doesn't care about performance, and doesn't really care about security, and doesn't care about compatibility with anybody else's system. <laughs> but it's there, right? It's one of the 200 plus cyber suites. You could, you could negotiate. You might struggle to find a server that would support this cyber suite. And the way it works is, again, at the start of the protocol, we'll see this in detail later, the client says, here are all of the cyber suites that I would like to use. Okay? So your typical client will maybe have 10 or 20 different cyber suites that it knows about. So the first one might be TLS, RSA, with uh, AES, CDC, SHA-256. That would be a pretty good cyber suite. So that would be using RSA encryption, for the authentication, we'll see how that's done later. Uh, AES in CDC mode for the encryption and SHA, HMAC SHA-256 for the uh, integrity protection. Okay? All the way down to something crazy like this. And then the server, when it receives this list of cipher suites in the very first message from the client, will say, ah, okay, I'd like to use this one on your list, number nine on your list, or number seven on your list. And you can configure your server to choose which version it wants to use according to what the uh, what the client version is, what the TLS version is, what the client software is, um, and what the list is that's offered by the client. Okay. So you've got this very kind of complex negotiation process going on during the protocol itself to decide what crypto you're going to use. 
Think about what challenge that presents to formal security analysis. You want to prove that this protocol is secure, say, that's your, tar your task. You're not at this workshop, this summer school, you're not at an attacks summer school, you're at a formal security analysis summer school. Okay, you have to switch your mind across. You want to prove that TLS is secure. Well, there's four different versions and 200 plus cyber suites. How are you going to prove that secure? Some of them might not even be secure anymore. Okay? So there's a huge challenge here to formal analysis to cope with this kind of complexity. Okay? Just to open up your mind a little bit more, um, for example, some of the cyber suites will use RSA for encryption, and some of them will use RSA for signatures. But a server can use the same public key for both purposes, the same key pair for both signing and encryption. Is that secure? Who knows? Okay. Well, actually it's not secure, but anyway. Um, then how do you analyze that? Well, you can't prove it's secure if you find an attack against it, but it's <coughs> part of the complexity of analyzing TLS. Okay. Then there are, oh, great question. How can I put my own insecure version of SSA in there so that I can then? <laughs> <laughs> so you're thinking like NSA now, right? You want yes. to subvert the standards I, process. Who yeah? the type that goes in that list? Um, it goes in that list because uh, somebody goes to the ITF and says, I really need this cipher suite for my particular application because blah, because I'm constrained or because I'm mad or whatever reason. And then eventually, uh, if you stick around for long enough and you're noisy enough, eventually they'll accept it and it'll get added to the list. It'll get assigned a special number. So every cipher suite is associated with a two-byte identifier, uh, which is the thing that's actually said in the protocol. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, push hard enough, you'll get your, your crazy cipher suite into the list. That's why there's 200 of them, right? So there's a lot of um, what I would call vanity cipher suites in there. Um, that's like, um, for example, there's a Japanese algorithm called Camellia, which is a block cipher. And there are lots and lots of Camellia-based cipher suites in there. Um, in, in TLS, because of this kind of multiplicative effect, right? You've got Camellia with MP5, Camellia with SHA-1, Camellia with SHA-2, that's So there's like, I don't know, 20 Camellia cyber suites. God knows why. I mean, why. Why do you need Camellia if you have AES, right? It's not going to be better than AES. Sorry to anybody who likes Camellia. It's there's a question. There's industry reason. Basic, there's a good industry reason. Basically, mm -hmm. all of the NTT products use Camellia because they develop Camellia. Yeah. So they want to use their own homebrew cyber. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say that is uh, bad for security. Not yeah. that I'm saying it's Camellia is a bad algorithm, but that kind of diversity can't be good. Right? Yeah. It means there are implementation errors, there might be security errors somewhere. It's, it's yeah. yeah. But I agree with you, that's a good reason. And thank you for the comment. Antoine? Do you just mean that it's better to have a single basket than many broken ones? No, I think it's good to have a diversity, but not too much diversity. Right? Are you going to make the same point? <coughs> Is null with null and null. And we'll see that later. It comes <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah. The null with null null <laughs> means there's nothing. But you, yeah, you need that actually, because that's effectively where you start from at the beginning of the handshake before you switch on crypto. But yeah, you can end up there too, right? <laughs> you don't have any crypto at all. Okay, so then there, then there are TLS extensions. This is going on with this ecosystem thing. Um, and there are two numerous dimensions. So lots of people have extended TLS in different ways because they want to do funky things with TLS. Okay? And sometimes uh, if somebody finds an attack, then the way to fix the attack, instead of redesigning the whole protocol, is to add an extension that enables you to do something else to avoid the attack. Then there's DTLS, which I really like. DTLS is basically TLS running over UDP instead of TCP. So instead of having all of the cost of setting up TCP connections, you say, I'm going to run everything over UDP instead, and that would be faster, but less reliable. And you have to change the protocol subtly to cope with that unreliability. And we'll look at DTLS later, because it's fun. You can break it much more easily than TLS, right? So that's why we're doing it. So that's part two of three. Then there's part three of three, which is who are all the people who are involved in this? The community of, of, of people. There's the TLS working group um, in ITF. So ITF is this weird organization. I, I started going to ITF meetings. And um, you have to be kind of crazy to, to, to work there. But it's one of these things where anybody can turn up and grab the mic and start speaking, right? Uh, and, and they do. Um, and there are all these kind of different cultural groups. There's a lot of guys with big, bushy beards there who've been doing the internet for like 30 years or something. And they know how everything is. <coughs> and then there's young guys, like, youngish guys like me who come along and say, no, 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 you don't want to do that way. And they say, but we've always done it that way. And they say, but yeah, but it's broken. Yes, but it's not that badly broken. 
You know, you get into this crazy, crazy conversation. So anyway, that's fun. Um, within within ITF, there's also the UTA working group using TLS and applications. So there's a whole working group dedicated to understanding how that application layer is going to make use of TLS. Then there's CFRG, which is where I'm involved. This is the Crypto Forum Research Group. And what we try to do is say, you know, you really shouldn't be using RC4 anymore. And try to provide some kind of crypto advice to, to, to these guys. Um, yeah, interesting conversation. Um, <coughs> Uh, okay, then there's this kind of community of researchers that sprung up really since about 2010, 2011. And you get people giving talks at Black Hat, which is you know, a hacker conference, and also at crypto. <coughs> people focusing on attacks and other people focusing on security proofs. People focusing exclusively on the handshake protocol or exclusively on the wrong record protocol or trying to understand how they interact with each other. Because they're complex, it's hard to study the whole thing in one go. Uh, there's, there's recent work being done uh, by the Microsoft India team looking at the entire protocol, including all of its ugly features like session resumption and renegotiation and so on, which we'll, we'll look at. Uh, there's people who use provable security, uh, you know, games, security games, that kind of thing. People who use formal methods, uh, other things in between that I don't pretend to understand. There's game-based approaches. <laughs> UC has been used to analyze the trends, where you can use constructive cryptography if you're in the Uli Maurer school of, of cryptography. Um, so there's lots of different people now buzzing around TLS and getting into it and trying to understand it and do something with it. And this means that the ecosystem has become really complicated and vibrant. There's, a lot, there's, there's something new about TLS almost every week. So you could spend your entire life just working on TLS. That is not a recommendation. I'm not, I'm not saying you should do that. It would be a bad thing to do. But it's a pretty interesting place to play. OK, uh, so a bonus slide, ecosystem 4 of 3. I, I thought I would put this up. This is a fantastic Twitter feed that was being run by Matt Green, uh, which he's not really running anymore, called OpenSSL Fact. And this predates all of the Harpley business uh, and all of the kind of dismay about how terrible the OpenSSL code base was, the kind of thing that, that um, Nadia was talking about earlier on. So if you, I don't know if you can read this, one terrible, frightening line of OpenSSL code each day, 365 days a year until the madness ends. All right? So Matthew was going through the OpenSSL source code and pulling out crazy lines of code from the source code, okay? and putting them on, on this Twitter feed. These ones are not the best. You have to go back a little bit in time. Here's, here's some examples. This is a comment. <laughs> comment in code, the aim of right shifting ND size is so the compiler doesn't figure out that it can remove diff spoiler which I hope is beyond it. So that's somebody saying, I've written my code in some kind of semi-obfuscated way to stop the compiler optimizing away the protection I put in against a particular attack. This is actually a protection against Lucky 13, I think, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Okay? So basically, um, well, we'll get there. We'll explain exactly what this means later. But this is, this is completely bonkers, that you're having to do this in your code to make, to make SSL secure. Here's another one, hash, uh, I guess this is like, is this commented out? No, what does that mean? Ah, it's a mango. Uh, okay, else if zero ended. So I mean, this is like code that doesn't do anything, right? If zero, is never, that means this code here never gets executed. Unless somebody missed out brackets, which could happen. Okay, that happens. So uh, if you want some fun and amusement and you're into coding, check out the OpenSSL facts uh, Twitter feed. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of dead now. There's not much going on in it, which is a shame because it's, it's good value for me. Okay, so that was your bonus slide. Uh, okay, so unless you've been hiding under a rock, you'll have noticed that TLS has been in the news. There's been a lot of research. There's the beast attack, crime, lucky 13, these RC4 attacks. There was the renegotiation attack back in 2009, which then, you know, we thought we had put a, we'd driven a stake through the heart of the renegotiation attack back then, but then it came back to life. It reanimated itself as the triple handshake attack this year, 2014. Um, there's lots of poor quality implementations out there, lots of bugs in software, and I only have a partial list here. Uh, from 2012, uh, CCS 2012, which is this paper, Why Eve and Mallory Love Android, which is basically an examination of the quality of TLS implementations on Android uh, platforms. Okay? Basically what they found, these guys, uh, this is the team from, uh, from Bochum, uh, they found that um, Basically, no Android implementation was checking certificates properly. So you can give it any old garbage certificate and it would accept it as being valid. Okay? Which means, for example, you could send to the antivirus software running on your mobile phone a 
false update uh, containing you know, bogus antivirus signatures, including an antivirus signature for the antivirus software. So that the antivirus software would recommend to the user that the antivirus software be uninstalled. Okay? And that was because they broke the security of the, of the update procedure in the antivirus software. I thought that was good. Uh, the most dangerous code in the world is a very nice paper by the guys from Stanford and elsewhere where they did a kind of similar examination, but they were looking more, more at payment systems and the way that payment systems use SSL TLS, and they found lots of really funny code, which meant that certificates, again, were not being checked off. There was the Apple GoToFill. How many of you have heard of the Apple GoToFill? Only a few of you. Okay. Um, wake up. So the Apple GoToFill is really cool. Basically, in the <coughs> Apple implementation of SSL TLS, there were some, uh, there was a, I get this right, there's a go-to statement where the brackets were not in the right place, and it meant that a big chunk of the certificate verification was bypassed in TLS, okay? So it meant that for certain types of certificate, they would never be checked, which meant that if you send such a certificate as a server, you could send anything, it was going to pass verification. I just remember something slightly different mm -hmm. related to a go-to, where it was, uh, in some copy of the code, uh, there were two copies of the same go-to. You're right. And so one was grabbed by the if and not the other one. Exactly. So one go-to was outside of the if yeah. statement, outside of the brackets, yes. and one was inside. And then the, the one that was outside always got executed. So and just, then be, just because the line had been duplicated. Because it had been duplicated by some editor. For some reason. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. OK. A similar issue was found <coughs> shortly thereafter in GNU TLS, which is another implementation of TLS. Uh, there was some nice work uh, by the Microsoft Internet team again on the trun on truncation attacks and cookie cutter attacks, uh, which we might get to. There was the CCS plug in OpenSSL that we found earlier this year, which meant basically this uh, this message which said, "Please change to using your keys now. I'm going to switch on my crypto." Um, that message would be accepted before the key exchange message had been sent, which meant that the, the the receiver of that message would derive keys from an empty buffer that didn't contain anything. So the keys were kind of predictable, right? The keys were basically null keys, or they were, they were derived from a null buffer, okay? And that had been in OpenSSL since the very first publication of OpenSSL back in 19, where that bug had been there, okay? And um, there's a Frankenstein paper where they basically uh, were able to construct certificates by gluing together pieces of other certificates and get verified. They were really testing out the certificate verification last year. So there's a lot of issues with implementations, Mostly, though, although TLS has been in the news, mostly it's the tech press, right? Mostly not really much crossover to mainstream media. But there's one thing missing from this list. Can anybody tell me? Heartbleed. Heartbleed. So TLS really hasn't been in the news. The kind of news that your auntie or your uncle would read, right? I mean, I started getting support calls from my mum after Heartbleed. <laughs> Should I change all my passwords? Yeah. Um, the Heartbleed bug. And it's an interesting question. What is it about, I'm questioning your views, what is it about Heartbleed that caught the public's imagination and the wider media's imagination? Why do you think it crossed over into the, 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 the mainstream news? Sorry? The name. The name, yeah. That's one reason. Anybody else? Have you all, who, who's not heard of Heartbleed? Anybody? Don't be afraid to admit it. I won't, I won't pick you out for not having heard of it. I just want to know. So everybody's heard of Heartbleed. Okay. So the name is one thing, good name. Easy to convey. Mm -hmm. XKCD. XKCD, yeah. Having a cartoon helps, yeah. So I, I wrote some. I, I think it's to do with the fact that it was a long sequence. And people like me were trying to tell the media about this and we were being kind of ignored. And then finally along came Hartley, which really was the big kahuna, right? It was the, the tsunami of all, uh, of all TLS attacks. So maybe the dam finally broke under the pressure of the Hartley tsunami. Um, actually, it was a very severe threat. So a lot of the other attacks I'm going to talk about in the next couple of days are kind of semi-practical, semi-theoretical. They're, they're things that a very determined hacker might be able to do, given enough determination. But this, you just had to send a packet to a server, and it would maybe cough up its private key. Okay, So it was a very severe threat. It was a bug in OpenSSL. And OpenSSL, it turned out, was used pretty much everywhere. So OpenSSL is built into Apache and Nginx, and those between them, that server software, that accounts for something like 85% of all servers out there on the internet are running either Apache or Nginx. So they affected 
uh, set was Jane, Jane Orange's huge I don't think people, this goes back to Fabio's point, how many people will really help us? How many good name for your attack really helps? So for example, when we came up with, uh, sorry, so when these guys came up with Beast and Crime, Duong and Rizzo, I'm sure it helped them to get publicity. That's why we called Lucky 13 Lucky 13, because we thought it was a cool name. And then when we did the RG4 attacks afterwards, we didn't come up with a cool name, and lots of people said to us, why don't you have a good name for your attack? Right? Mm -hmm. Be very you get, you know. So having a good name and a good logo really helps. Okay. So Hartley, we might talk about Hartley if you really want to. Yes? Do you know why it's hot? Why? Uh, why hot and why beat? Okay, so it's based on attacking something called the heartbeat protocol, like okay. a heartbeat. Okay. And uh, you know, it's bleeding information, mm -hmm. right? So heartbeat. It's a clever name, actually. It's a nice name. Yeah, it's a very nice name. And we'll see another application of the heartbeat protocol later on. I'll show you an attack that exploits heartbeat. Okay. So back to this picture of the protocol architecture, we're now going to look in detail at the record protocol. Okay? Everybody still with me? What does the record protocol do? Anybody? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing until until the handshake has run. Okay, and then what does it do? Antoine, you're not going to answer. Antoine has two brains, by the way. One of them he's using to his email. And the other is using the phone. I'm not reading email, okay. I'm writing a research proposal. Ah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay because I'm reading Antoine's email. That's, that's, that's <laughs> Between us, we have a comment. Okay, so what does the record protocol do? <coughs> Anybody? Yes? It does basically the symmetric crypto. Symmetric crypto? Good. And what security is it providing? What do we aim to achieve with it? Blake security at once. Sorry? Blake security at once. Link security. Yeah, security. yeah, it's channel security. I mean, link would mean point to point, really, traditionally. Okay, this is end to end from client to server. Okay, but yes. So we're trying to provide confidentiality and what was the other magic word? Authentication or integrity, right? In the IETF, they call it authentication, and I think that's very confusing. I think integrity is a much better word. We want to be sure that the data has not been modified in transit from the client to the server or the server to the client. Okay, that's the objective. Okay. Okay, let's read what this says here, right? Uh, so we have data origin authentication or integrity, using a Mac, confidentiality. We also want some other features. We want an anti-replay service. And we want to maintain the order of the, of the messages in the secure channel. So what we, we don't want is that an attacker can say, delete one of the messages from the channel so that the receiver gets the sequence of messages with one missing and can't detect that that's happened. We also don't want the attacker to be able to reorder things or to send, to, to grab a message on the channel and then resend it so that the same message is received twice. Because bad things can happen if, if, if you allow those things to happen, okay? You can imagine scenarios where bad things would happen. So we have an anti-replay uh, service, and it's more than anti-replay, it's, um, it's also prevention of, uh, of reordering, for example. There's optional compression. Why? Why might we want compression? What are we compressing? Well, don't try to compress your ciphertext, right? Because <laughs> that really won't work very well. So what's left? What would you try to compress? Come on, I'll give you a big clue. <laughs> no, be brave, man in the check shirt, be brave. You're almost ready, aren't you? Go on. No, behind. No, you. Yes, you. What would we compress? Well, the original data. Yeah, exactly. Good, so it was an easy question, right? Antoine. Yeah, just one question. Yeah. Should be a theoretical question. Uh -huh. uh, when we are doing classical crypto, you want to have indistinguishability. Yes. So if I send two plain texts of the same <coughs> size, I want the ciphertext to be indistinguishable. You would, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. But if you are doing compression, if I send, send a long random string mm -hmm. on one side mm -hmm. and a, a string of zero of the same length, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be able to distinguish. Absolutely. So adding compression is breaking the security. So you've exactly. just invented the crime attack. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this issue about the use of compression, I don't know if everybody understood what Antoine was saying, so I'll say it again briefly. If you compress your data before you encrypt it, different data will compress to different amounts, right? A random string will compress much less than a string of all zeros. So that immediately gives you what's called a distinguishing attack. If the attacker can control you know, he's, he, he says, I want either M0 or M1 to be encrypted. Okay, this is the classic indistinguishability kind of attack. 
uh, he doesn't know which one does get encrypted, and his job is to figure that out, then by choosing one message that compresses and another message that does not compress well, then looking at the length of the final ciphertext will tell him which message got sent. Okay? And so you get one bit of information. You learn whether M0 was encrypted or whether M1 was encrypted. But if you're clever enough, uh, if you're doing the Ritzel, you can turn that into an attack that recovers plain text. And that's the crime attack, basically, which we'll talk about later. Okay? This was already known as an issue. The compression was bad for security back in 2004. John Kelsey from this wrote a paper saying, ah, this doesn't really look very good, but didn't give a concrete attack against TLS. And Duong and Rizzo did, without being aware, actually, of, uh, of the paper. It turns out that compression was almost never being used anyway by TLS. It's an optional thing, but it's there. And it has, it's an interesting thing that it was put there to make TLS more efficient. Right? If you have to encrypt less data, then you can go faster. But it turns out to be really bad for security. Okay. Um, another thing that TLS provides is fragmentation. So when you send a message from your application in that picture before, back here, from your application here to the record protocol, your message might be very long. But the record protocol, for, for good reasons, has a maximum message size that it will send. It's about 2 to the 14 bytes. So that's about 16,000 bytes that it will send. Okay? So what happens is that the record protocol, when it receives a message from the application, first of all, cuts it up into little chunks and sends each of the chunks individually. So this is, this is fragmenting, breaking up. And at the other end, um, it doesn't defragment. It just gives back whatever it receives. It doesn't say, by the way, this was a fragment of a bigger message. It just gives a stream back to the application. Okay? So this also has, can have quite severe security consequences, this fragmentation property. I don't think, actually, we fully understand this yet. So if you're looking for an area to do research in, what does, what does this fragmentation feature enable us to do? There's a couple of attacks that are based on it, but I think there's more to be discovered there. OK, so that's what the protocol is doing. And here's how it does it. Okay? And this is the famous MAC encode encrypt uh, construction used by the TLS record protocol. And we're going to be analyzing this to death over the next couple of days. So you really need to get this into your heads. But I'll repeat it at various points. Okay? But now is a good time to try to get this into your head. So here is the payload coming from the application layer. So this is the message that's come from here and then has been fragmented. And so this is one of the fragments, okay? Or possibly a whole message, depending whether fragmentation has taken place or not. We're going to pass it through this blue box, which, believe me, says MAC inside it, message authentication code, okay? And we're going to MAC the payload together with some metadata. And the metadata here uh, consists of a sequence number and a header field. The sequence number is eight bytes long, 64 bits, and it just is a counter that increases by one for each packet or each message that you send. And the header contains five bytes, and it contains uh, two bytes of message length, two bytes of content, no, one byte of content type, and two bytes to tell you which version of TLS you're using. Okay. There's really no good reason to have the TLS version number in here, but it's there. For, I don't know why. And 8 bytes here plus 5 bytes there is, what's 8 plus 5? Easy question. 13. Okay, the lucky 13. Right? So it turns out that lucky 13 works in some sense, at least the basic version of it, because this number is 13. Because it's exactly 13. And we'll see why. <laughs> so we're going to pass all of this stuff, 13 bytes plus the payload, through our Mac algorithm. And here are your options for the Mac. Uh, there are other options too, but the most popular ones, they're all based on this HMAC construction. So HMAC is a generic way of building a MAC algorithm out of a hash function. Okay? Very nice way of doing it, very efficient, um, and has good security properties. And we take our, the output of the MAC, which is called the MAC tag, okay? and we append it to <coughs> the payload. And this step of appending the MAC and then adding some padding is the encoding step. Okay? That's why it's MAC encode encrypt. So this box says inside it, encrypt. And typical encryption algorithms that you'll get, at least in TLS below 1.2, so 1.0, 1.1, include things like uh, CDC mode of ADS with 128-bit keys, 256-bit keys if you're paranoid, or you're worried about quantum computers, okay? triple DES if you don't care about performance, uh, RT4 if you don't care about security. Okay? <laughs> so this is, your, this, this is uh, what the encryption is going to do, and it's going to give you the ciphertext. Now, the padding is there. Why is the padding there? 
Why do we need padding? Anybody? Get the cipher block length. Right. So CVC mode needs padding, right? Yeah. Because we can, in CVC mode, we'll, I'll show you CVC, so that CVC mode in a minute. We're going to encrypt one block at a time, or well, we're going to encrypt a whole sequence of blocks, but we can only operate on full blocks, like 16 bytes at a time, this AES. And this thing coming out of here, the payload plus the MAC tag, might not be a multiple of the block length. So we're going to have to add some padding before we do CVC mode. If you're using RC4, you don't need padding, and there isn't any padding in that case. Okay. And somebody else at the front said something else interesting. Gentleman who's, you said something, you waved your hands around and said something interesting. Yeah, it was just about the same thing. Ah, I thought you were going to say something else. I thought you were going to say something, having looked here, that the amount of padding you add, okay, it could be one byte, zero, zero, this is hexadecimal, right? Or two bytes, 0101, or three bytes, 020202, and so on, up to, till you hit the block boundary. But you can keep on going. You can go all the way up to 256 copies of FF. So the amount of padding you add is, can be variable. It can be any amount as long as it brings you to a block boundary. And this enables you to hide the length of the payload up to some limits, right? You can pad out so that all, if your protocol only uses short messages, you can pad them all out to be messages of the same length. <coughs> Why would you want to do that? Well, for semantic security, maybe? For distinguishability? I mean, uh, the semantic security models don't really say anything. They just assume that the two messages you're encrypting, N0 and M1, are the same length. And therefore, somehow magically, the ciphertext is the same length. So, in fact, the semantic security models are completely inadequate for analyzing this kind of construction. So, that's, that's me putting theory back in the box. Right? <laughs> so, um, uh, another reason you might want to do it is because you, hiding the payload length might be important. Suppose you only ever send two messages across TLS. Um, one of them is attack at dawn, and the other is retreat. Okay? Attack at dawn will encrypt to be a longer message than retreat would. So if the attacker can just see the length of the ciphertext, he knows whether you're going to attack or not. Okay? It's a very hypothetical, very theoretical situation, but still, we want to prevent as much as, much as possible the attacker just looking at ciphertexts and learning something about messages. But this is a, an interesting example of what you might call function creep. The padding was initially there just to bring everything up to the same length. But then they decided, in their wisdom, that look, you know, we can play with this a little bit. We can have variable length padding. Maybe we can get some kind of prevention of traffic analysis at the same time for free from this, from this padding feature. But what do you notice about this padding? What cryptographic protection is applied to it? It's encrypted right there. It's encrypted, but it's not mapped. Okay? So now, in your ciphertext, you've got data that has been encrypted, but not mapped. This should fire off a little alarm bell in the back of your head. Right? This is bad news for security. And there's a whole bunch of attacks based on um, the fact that it's encrypted, but not integrity protected. And we'll see those at some point. When am I supposed to talk, stop today? Oh, we've only got 18 slides on an hour. My God, we're in trouble already. Okay. I have to go twice as fast to get through the slides. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and uh, down here, of course, you can have things like Camellia or your favorite block cipher here. Remember, there are 200 cipher suites. Uh, there's a lot of diversity down there. Okay. So this is the, the main construction that we want to analyze in the next couple of days. But any questions about this before we go forwards? You will see it again. Is the header up there and the header down there the same? Good question. Excellent, thank you. The header here is 5 bytes, and the header there is also 5 bytes, and it's the same 5 bytes. But what's missing? What's not transmitted? The sequence number is not transmitted. The header is, but the sequence number is not. And the idea is that this is running over TCP, which is reliable. So the sender maintains a copy of the sequence number, and increases it by 1 for each packet that it sends, and includes it in the MAC computation here. That says MAC. And the receiver has a copy of the sequence number too. It starts at zero for the new when, once the crypto is switched on, and for each packet that it receives, it increases the sequence number by one, and uses that value when it later verifies the MAC. Okay, but the sequence number is never actually sent as part of the packet. Just the sender and the receiver maintain their own copies of what they think the sequence number should be, and because TCP is reliable, 
Um, it should be that you don't lose any messages uh, by, the time you, by the time you're doing your decryption and checking your Macs. The TCP connection will have cleaned up everything for you and made sure that all the packets have arrived or all the messages have arrived <coughs> in the correct order. Okay? But TCP goes wrong sometimes. It dies. And at that point, then you might end up missing a packet or using the wrong sequence number to verify a Mac. And then you'll get an error and a connection failure. TLS will die at that point. Okay. So the, the header is transmitted, but the sequence number is not. Yes? So when you use the UDP, you need the sequence number? Brilliant, yeah. So when you run DTLS, which is TLS over UDP, you need the sequence number because UDP might deliver things out of order or just lose packets. So that's one of the main changes from going from TLS to DTLS, is to make the sequence number that's, that's missing down here to make it explicit. Exactly. Good, good question, good comment. Okay, so what this says is basically how it works, which we've already gone through in some detail. Uh, I think you'll get these slides later when I finish them. Um, so you can <coughs> check all this out later. What about the reverse direction? What happens when we receive a header and a ciphertext? What will the steps be? Who wants to talk us through the steps? What would be the first thing to do? Decrypt. Decrypt. Slow down one at a time. Okay, good. Do you decrypt, then what do you do? Decode. Decode, okay. So what does decoding involve? Remove the remove padding. Uh-huh. Remove the padding. Okay. Segment tag and tag. Uh-huh. So then you would you remove the padding, throw that away, it's useless. You would you would split this into the payload and the Mac tag. How do you know how to split it into payload and Mac tag? Yeah, you know the length of the Mac tag. It's going to be a fixed size determined by which <coughs> thing you're using here. So if you've negotiated HMAC ND5, this tag will have 16 bytes. If you've negotiated HMAC SHA1, it will have 20 bytes. Okay, good. So now you've got your payload and your MAC tag. What are you going to do next? <coughs> cool, sorry? Yeah, you recalculate the MAC, exactly. You will, at that point, need to use your local copy of the sequence number, whatever you think it should be. Put that together with the header information from here. And the payload, put it back through the Mac algorithm and check that the Mac tag you get is the same as the one that you received. Right? Everybody happy with that? Have you all met Macs before? Message authentication codes? No. Some of you have not, right? Yes? No? Maybe? Ish? Okay. Think of it as being like a keyed hash function. It's, it's got a key and it's going to squish all of your data down into a short value, which is somehow unique, right? It's, you can't calculate that value without having the key. That's the idea. So this one will have some, be a short thing, maybe 20 bytes or 32 bytes, that somehow, uh, if somebody modified the payload or modified the sequence number or the header, the MAC calculation would go wrong when you try to redo it at the other end, when you verify the MAC. So that's MAC in a nutshell. Okay, good. So we skipped over one step rather quickly. We said, ah, we removed the padding. How do, we, how do we remove the padding? How are we going to do it? How do you know where the padding starts? Okay, good question. So what you would do is, once you've done your decryption, you've got this thing here in a data structure, like a buffer in your C code, say, if we're doing it in C. And you would look at the end of the buffer, you know how long the buffer is, and you would say, well, what's the last byte here? And that would tell you, you know, okay, uh, the last byte was 02, then I should be looking for a pattern 020202. And that would tell me how many bytes to remove. If you were a lazy programmer, what would you do? Yeah? Just take the last byte and then remove the indicated number of bytes. Precisely. You would say, I, I've got an O2, I'll remove three bytes in total, O2 plus one, and not check that the rest of them have the correct format. Okay? We're going to break that in a little while. So we're going to, we're going to beat up the lazy programmers, okay? <laughs> we're going to try to. Okay, so we're also going to beat up the programmers who do it properly and who say, oh, I've got an FF here, then I should check the preceding 255 bytes and make sure they're all FFs before I do anything else. Okay? What should you do if the padding is not correct, if it's not one of these patterns? What should you do? What do you think? Something's gone wrong, right? What does it mean? We're running over TCP, nice reliable communications channel. Resend. Okay, resend is one option. Yes, Antoine? Abort everything. Abort everything is another option. So those are the two extremes. 
<laughs> what TLS does, because it's running over TCP, if anything ever goes wrong, then you assume that you're under attack. Okay? And so you throw everything away. You throw away your keys, you throw away the plain text, you don't do any processing on it, and you send an error <coughs> message. Okay? Back to the sender saying something went wrong, failed. Um, okay, which is interesting. So any kind of failure during padding processing or subsequent checking the Mac in TLS is a fatal error and leads to the TLS session being terminated and all of the keys being thrown. Okay, um, now here's a challenge, okay? I want you to tell me how you're going to remove this padding without leaking the fact that maybe the padding wasn't correctly formatted. Why do you need to do that? Well, the problem is, and we'll see this in a lot more detail later, the problem is that the attacker could maybe add some ciphertext blocks on the end here that maybe look like padding, but aren't padding, but they're actually plain text. And depending on how you process those blocks and what error messages you send, you might leak information about what's inside those blocks. And in other words, you end up, in other words, you end up leaking plain text information because of the way that you process padding. Okay? And that's at the heart of these padding or attacks that I'll talk about later. There's another thing you should do, though. Suppose that you see, I don't know, uh, FF as the last byte. And you say, OK, I want to remove 255 more copies of that, 256 copies of FF altogether. Is there anything else you need to do before you start removing bytes? <laughs> Antoine's laughing. What do you need to do? Yes? There could be no padding. Yeah. There's always going to be some, actually. The rule is there's always at least one byte of padding, up to 256 bytes. So you can't have no padding. You could have too much padding, though. Right? If this value at the end is FF, but the overall size of this structure is less than 256 bytes, you can't remove 256 bytes of padding. There's just not enough bytes left to remove. You'd end up with a naive implementation. You would end up with an underflow. You would end up reading bytes past the start of your buffer because you'd be reading backwards down your, down your buffer and you would underflow at the beginning. Okay? So you have to implement this so that you do sanity checks <coughs> that checks that everything fits in. Right? I want to remove 256 bytes because this value is FF, but I need enough bytes in total to have space for some payload and a Mac tag. So you have to do some arithmetic. But this sanity checking that you're going to do must not leak any of the values of the, of the, of the plain text bytes that you're checking. Otherwise, there are attacks. Okay? So the, 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 the message here is that it's a nightmare to do this properly. And I'll show you all the different ways that can go wrong and has gone wrong in the past over when we get to the padding or attack part. Okay? So this construction is really, really delicate. And it's actually the wrong way to, do, to build a secure channel using encryption and Mac. You should be doing encrypt then Mac instead of Mac then encrypt. But at the time when TLS was designed, people didn't know that. The theory didn't exist in the mid-90s to tell you which is better. And Schneier said, use Mac then encrypt. And Schneier was God in the 90s. <laughs> now we know he's a man. Okay? But he was a god in the crypto god in the 90s. And yes? Yeah, cool. Go ahead. Just to be a very short question. No, no. Precisely, what, what does the standard say about how much padding you should have? All these rules that you're <coughs> describing are implicit, right? So it just says you need to add at least something? Yeah, it says um, you need to add one of these patterns, and which one you add is up to you. And every implementation, except one that I know of, adds the minimum amount of padding. So it doesn't use this variable length feature. The one that doesn't, the one that actually uses variable length, picks one of the random possibilities for the length, uh, picks one of the possibilities at random, and then adds that many bytes. And that was GNU TLS. But until 2013, it was actually incorrectly implemented. <laughs> for some reason, for some, they didn't, they didn't check the edge conditions properly. Like they had the loop starting at the wrong value. So it was broken. OK. Um, and we'll see later exactly what the spec says and what advice it gives implementers and how that advice isn't really good enough for us. Okay? So padding is going to be our friend as, as attackers. So anytime you're analyzing a protocol, if somebody uses padding, focus on that as a potential means of breaking the protocol. Okay? It's a good thing to do. Uh, and try to design your protocol so that it doesn't have any padding at all. Use counter 
Okay, so we were talking about the reverse steps, right? So we said we receive the message, we decrypt, we remove the padding, this is complicated, we check the Mac, we might do decompression because we might have compress first, and then we pass the payload to the upper layer. So we basically reverse these steps, eventually we recover this payload and we just give it to the application that, that was running the TLS session. Notice though that there's no defragmentation at the receiving side. So you can send a big message as a sender, it gets split up into all these small messages, they all get delivered one after another in separate TLS records, and then those are all given one after another to the application <coughs> at the other end. Without telling that application, by the way, these all came from one big message at the other end. In other words, TLS is providing a stream kind of functionality to applications. Not exactly what you might think. <coughs> As well as stream, so if I have, if I input data to the TLS uh, layer, this is stream as well, right? So there's no uh, semantic of a message. That's true, but the way applications often think of TLS is you provide a message and it sends it for you. Sure. But technically, you're right. It is actually providing a streaming functionality on both ends. It's true. Good. Yes. Is there any, anything special done with CDC at the boundary? And the boundary is between between, the, between several packets or between several uh, transmissions. Um, we'll come to that. Yes, I know is the answer. Yeah. So <laughs> we'll come to it. Um, this is in red, and it's in red because it's important. Okay. Errors can arise from any of these steps: decryption, padding removal, or MAC checking. I guess decompression as well. And all of these are fatal errors in TLS. So you would send an error message and uh, back to the sender, and you tear down the connection. Okay, now, this is not the only possibility. It's what was available up until TLS 1.2. And then in TLS 1.2, they added dedicated AEAD algorithms, authenticated encryption with associated data. And these are basically uh, algorithms that do encryption and integrity protection in one pass. Okay, this is the kind of modern way to think about symmetric encryption and what symmetric encryption should be providing. Um, these don't have to fit with this me template. In fact, in another <coughs> RFC, 5116, there's an interface specified that enables you to use any AEAD algorithm with, with TLS. And there are two algorithms specified, <coughs> GCM and CCM, in two separate RFCs. And GCM is becoming more popular as TLS 1.2 takes off. So what does GCM do? It's basically counter mode encryption with a very kind of lightweight Mac, which is based on some kind of universal hashing, polynomial hashing, basically. And then you have to encrypt that hash value to prevent, to prevent attacks. So it's, a, it's a, an algorithm that's actually much faster than CBC mode plus HMAC, and uh, maybe has better security guarantees as well. Okay, and CCM is, is horrible, we won't talk about it. It's basically counter mode together with CBC Mac. So it's not any faster than uh, CBC mode plus, plus HMAC, really. Um, and I don't think anybody's really using it as far as I'm aware. So GCM is becoming more and more popular. So um, turns out though that, well, it's only recently that we've started using uh, TLS 1.2 and therefore been able to use this uh, GCM algorithm. So right now, around the last month, 42.6% uh, of the top 200,000 websites were using or supporting TLS 1.2. Okay. A year ago that was 17% and two years ago it was only 5%. So in the last two years, TLS 1.2 support on servers has gone from 5% to 42.6%. It's really taken off. There's a wonderful website you can go to called SSL Pulse, which is, um, uh, contains a monthly update on the state of SSL across the, kind of the internet. It's run by a guy called Ivan Rustic. And I'm supposed to plug his book. He's got a, a very nice book out called Bulletproof SSL, uh, or Bulletproof TLS. I can't remember. One, one of those two. And it's, it's a very interesting, very kind of hands-on, pragmatic book on SSL and TLS security. And uh, he told me to plug his book. OK. So if any of you know him, you can tell him to plug his book. Um, what about on the browser side, or the, or the client side? So thinking just about browsers, all of the browsers, all of the mainstream browsers now do support TLS 1.2. But that only happened last year, so I, I checked on Wikipedia back in November 2013, and here are all the release versions, and these are quite recent numbers. I, I guess Chrome is now up to release 30-something, 30 35 or 36 or something. Uh, 
So only recently did 1.2 get switched on in browsers. Okay? So it's not that long ago um, that we didn't have 1.2 at all really. And they're not actually in widespread use yet. So here's some statistics I got from the internet. This is actually from another really cool uh, project called the ICSI Certificate Notary Project, which again, every month, publishes numbers about usage of SSL TLS on the internet. And we have these nice pie charts. Okay, and here's a list of cipher suites. And I've highlighted here the ones which are using GCM. It's only 15.3% total. And this, this survey is based on something like 1 billion TLS connections, and they have some probes out there in the internet core somewhere, and they're able to, to listen and see what, what cyber suites people are negotiating. So even though 40% of servers support TLS 1.2, and all the major routers support TLS 1.2, the actual amount of 1.2 and, and GCN is getting negotiated is still only 15%. And it would be cool if we could increase this number. And the one way to increase this number is to break everything else, right? which is why we do it, really, and other people too. Oh, there's this one down here. Uh, Chacha 20 Poly 1305, it's kind of cut off a little bit. This is an alternative to using RC4 with good performance in software. And it's currently at 1.6%. And this is basically because Google has switched on Chacha 20 Poly 1305 in Chrome when Chrome talks to a Google server. You, there's a good chance you'll end up using this instead of RC4. Okay? Um, so this is also, uh, this is kind of an experimental cyber suite. It doesn't, it's not even officially mandated yet by ITF, but because Google can do whatever the hell it wants, because it owns the endpoints, both endpoints, it's at 1.6%, right? and that will increase too. Okay, so we're not really there yet with AEAD, but it's coming. Okay, sequence numbers we talked about. Uh, I think we won't say any more about that. Okay, now we want to talk about the handshake protocol. And because the handshake is not really that important to the rest of these lectures, we'll maybe go through this material quite quickly and then we'll, then we'll have lunch. Um, I wanted to, however, give you some kind of hint about what's going on in the handshake, because it's useful to have this kind of broader view of how TLS is operating. Okay, any questions though before we go on and talk about the handshake, about the record protocol, how it works? Is it what you thought it would be? What's, what's, what's there that you didn't think would be there? Or what's not there that you thought would be there? Okay. Yes? So why there is no defragmentation? Like defragmentation? Yeah, it should be easy to support. It's what this gentleman said here, that, that really TLS is about providing a stream, a streaming mm -hmm. interface to yeah, at both ends. Wouldn't it be more convenient for the applications? Um, I think it probably would, but maybe, maybe, maybe yeah, I don't know. I don't know enough about what real applications want to do. I think for some applications it would be, and maybe others it would not. I guess mm -hmm. is, is one way of saying it. I'm not really sure. That's not a very good answer, is it? You should demand your money back when you're on the road. Demand my fee back. My fee is zero, by the way. All right, so let's talk about this handshake protocol. Um, okay, so we've seen that TLS needs symmetric keys, it needs IVs for some of the encryption algorithms like CDC mode. These are all going to come from the handshake protocol. What are the goals? Well, we're interested in entity authentication of the partners to the protocol. We are interested in establishing fresh shared secrets, okay, which are going to be used in the record protocol. And we're interested in secure negotiation of all of the cryptographic <coughs> parameters. So this is a protocol that negotiates itself as it goes along and later tries to say, did we agree on what we negotiated? Did we actually have the same view of, of, of what we ended up with? Which is scary, right? I mean, it's like self, I don't know, it's like the robots are gonna take over the planet or something. Self-negotiating self protocol doesn't sound like a good idea, but that's what it is. Okay, um, there are, so let's look at key establishment first. So it supports different <coughs> key establishment mechanisms. And the method that we use is negotiated during the handshake itself. So in the very first message, which is called the client hello, the client sends a list of the cyber suites that it supports, and the server selects one of those cyber suites. So here's an example. Here's a more This is the, the sensible one that I talked about earlier. So it's saying, I want to use RSA encryption for the key transport. I'm going to use, later I'm going to use AES and CDC mode with 256-bit keys, and I'm going to use SHA-256 AH Okay, so that's a cyber suite. And there's another one, that's that crazy one with Kerberos. 
A very common choice of cyber suite is, involves the use of RSA encryption. And here what happens is the client chooses a string, a random string, called the pre-master secret. It encrypts it using the RSA key, the public RSA key of the server, which it gets from the server during the, during the initial exchange of messages. And it sends that cybertext to the server. Okay? So the client is choosing the pre-master secret and sending it to the server, encrypted with the server's public key. What are the different ways that that could go wrong? Well, there are almost too numerous to list here. One of them is that you're relying on clients to choose good random values, because all of the keys are going to be derived from this pre-master secret. And maybe Nadia will talk more about that later. I hope that she does. Another way that it goes wrong is that the encryption algorithm is not CCA secure, if you know about tools of cybertech security. It uses something called PKCS number one version 1.5 time, which is a disaster, a complete disaster. And Blackenbacher in 1998 showed a semi-practical attack based on the fact that this padding method is not CCA secure. But still, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2 still uses PKCS number one version 1.5 time. And the reason is that in the RFC, they put advice about how to avoid Blackenbacher's attack. So instead of stripping out this broken crypto algorithm and replacing it with something that was CCA secure, they did a patch, they did a bodge, a fix, to make the protocol go on, to allow it to continue to carry on without making too many changes, without upsetting too many implementers. And this happens over and over and over again in TLS. They take the path of least resistance every time. They do the simplest possible fix at any given moment in time. And that's bad for security, right? And we'll see examples of that later on. So much sadness has resulted as a consequence of this. Not only because it's insecure, but it makes it much harder to analyze. If you're trying to prove the security of the TLS handshake, you now have to deal with a, a, a mechanism which is transporting the secret from the client to the server, which isn't CCA secure. Okay, so how, how are you going to analyze that? I mean, you know, okay, maybe chosen cyber text attacks are not possible against this in the TLS context. But it'd be nice if you could start with CCA security and go can't, unfortunately. Okay, so uh, you can also create a pre-master secret using Diffie-Hellman. There's actually two different ways of doing that. You can have static Diffie-Hellman or ephemeral Diffie-Hellman. And you can also have anonymous Diffie-Hellman, uh, just to keep everybody confused. So static Diffie-Hellman means that the server has a fixed key, g to the y, that it sends to the client. And it uses g to the y in all of its different connections with different clients. And g to the y is actually in its certificate. So when it sends its cert, the cert contains this value. Ephemeral Diffie-Hellman means that both the client and the server choose one-off ephemeral values, g to the x and g to the y. And g to the y is then signed by the server using maybe an RSA key or using ECDS. Okay, so there are different algorithm choices there as well. I say that it's ephemeral, but in reality it probably isn't. Servers are not very uh, keen to do lots of exponentiation. So they tend to use the same ephemeral value for many different clients. Mm. Sad. <laughs> Sad face. Okay? Anonymous Diffie-Hellman means that um, you do Diffie-Hellman with ephemeral values, but nobody authenticates anything. The client doesn't sign anything, and the server doesn't sign anything. Okay? So this is, this is vulnerable to man the middle attacks. But it's a quick and dirty way of setting up secure communications if you're not worried about an active man in the middle attacker. Should you be worried about such an attacker? Active man in the middle attacker? Yes. NSA does active mind and attacks against all kinds of protocols, according to its own documents. You should care about this. Yes, Claudio? So, is the idea of the anonymous VPN and then we can do the authentication after we establish the key? Ah, possibly, or just, uh, uh, you know, we just want the best security we can get without any kind of pre established infrastructure. This doesn't need any certificates, for example. So, so you, but we could do this. You, you could do it afterwards, after, right? yeah. yeah. Because there's a feature in TLS that enables you to do something called renegotiation. Which says we run the handshake, set up a secure channel, <coughs> and we rerun the handshake over the existing record protocol. And then you could have strong authentication if you wanted to. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so what about key derivation? Well, here's how key derivation works. So whichever one of these methods we've, we've, we've selected, we end up with this pre-master secret. So this could either be something chosen by the client when we're using RSA encryption, or it could be this sticking element value, g to the xy, that we've exchanged. And that g to the xy could be g to the xy mod p, or it could be g to the xy on an elliptic curve. 
Yes. By the way, where does the Diffie-Hellman group come from? Ah, good question. So <laughs> I haven't shown it here, but the star for choosing the Diffie-Hellman group. So the client should really check that the Diffie-Hellman group it's getting is a good Diffie-Hellman group. That G is a generator, and that P is a prime, and P minus one isn't smooth. Uh -huh. And for elliptic curves, so, so, so the yeah. server sends a group. Yep. It's not standardized. It's, it's not at the moment. Until it's 1.3, it will be standardized. Okay, and, uh, and we send uh, the prime, the G, yep. and the, the order of G. Um, <coughs> well, the order of G will be p minus one. No, 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 no. P minus one. Well, no, it doesn't send the order of G. No, it doesn't actually. The order of G, you would ideally would be P minus one. So they are working with the subgroup, they are working with the full it, it depends on the server implementation. <coughs> it's a bit of a mess. For elliptic curves, it's slightly better. There are named elliptic curves, and you would send one of those, okay, or a list of those, <coughs> that you support. Okay, in fact, no, you send one. And if the client doesn't support it, you have to start again. Okay? So, which, whichever way you do it, you end up with this pre-master secret here. <coughs> We're going to pass that through a pseudo-random function, the TLS 1.2 PRF, to get something called the master secret. And then we're going to combine the master secret with the nonces to, through the same PRF to get something called the key block. Now these nonces are sent, one is sent by the client and one is sent by the server. They're random numbers. They're, they're 32 bytes long. Okay? Actually, technically, they're 28 bytes of random number plus four bytes of time. Unix time, actually. Uh, but some implementations just have 32 bytes of randomness. So here's another place where TLS uses random numbers or not so random numbers, depending on how good your random number generator is. Back to, <coughs> back to the, the first talk as well. So the client has sent an the server has sent an in the first pair of messages being exchanged. All of that gets fed into here to give us our key block. We take the key block now and we cut it up into chunks. The first chunk goes to the, the encryption key, the second chunk goes to the Mac key, and so on. And in fact, we have different keys in different directions. The client key is different from the server key, or the right key and the key. Why do you want different keys in different directions? I did say I would ask questions. Yes? So you can bounce back a message uh, if you have the same sequence on the same. Exactly. To prevent reflection attacks. Where you take a message that was being sent by the client to the server and send it back to the client. And the client accepts it because, hey, the mic is good. Okay? If you have different keys in different directions, you can't do that. There are other ways to prevent reflection attacks, like putting labels and saying this is a message from the client to the server, or the server to the client. But TLS does it with key separation, different keys in different directions. Okay? Why do we have this two-part thing with a pre-master secret followed by a master secret? I don't expect you to answer that, actually. It's a really nasty question. Um, okay, I guess we can... Why don't we, well, we'll come back to that question maybe after lunch. Let me just check that we've said everything that was on here. Oh, yeah, what's this PRF? Well, you can now negotiate it in TLS 1.2 as part of the cyberspace negotiation. You can say, I want to use this PRF. Everybody uses a special PRF that is built by iterating HMAC SHA256. But this is not a standard way. What TLS does is not a standard way of building a PRF out of HMAC or out of a hash function. It's its own kind of special construction which I don't think has been analyzed properly. Previous versions, old versions, used this really ugly ad hoc construction based on MD5 and SHA-1. I mean, at least, at least they designed something that didn't totally rely on MD5. Okay, it had two bad hash functions and MD7-1. That's a joke. And, okay, uh, again, we use this TLS-PRF, and then we split everything up into the, into the keys. Okay. So that is probably a good place to stop for lunch. When we come back after lunch, we'll talk about why we have this two-step process here and some other features of, of TLS, okay? Thank you very much.